intent of this session is for us to define priorities and overcome barriers to TB diagnostics at the point of care. So we've got some people on the panel up here who are talking from the technology point of view and trying to identify biomarkers or develop technologies. And there are others here who have been using technologies um, uh, implementing for diagnostics both for TB and for HIV. And we want to, we want to have these people uh, help us start the conversation, but we'd like to have you help us finish the conversation. We have an hour, uh, which will be a very long time if we do it in silence, and it will go very quickly if we uh, have a lot of interchange. Um, there are a variety of types of uh, obstacles, obviously, that, that will come to mind for all of you, some of which would come for obstacles, for example, to uh, developing uh, diagnostics, getting them funded, uh, getting commercial partners, technical obstacles, uh, regulatory obstacles, etc. And then there's the downstream uh, implementation obstacles also that uh, many of you will be familiar with. And I'd like to start with those uh, and ask, ask first Grant, who's here from South Africa, to talk to us a little bit about their experience of trying to use existing technologies at point of care and how feasible that is and what, um, what particular obstacles are, are present there. Grant? Thanks, Mark. Um, so, I'm really going to speak from a perspective um, of a study that we recently uh, completed, and in fact, it's included in the information packs outside. And this study was a four country multi center randomized controlled trial using Gene Expert. And what we did was that we placed Gene Expert in primary care clinics. This was in a well resourced peri urban setting. And we used a non technical research nurse to complete the gene expert test. And this was done physically located at the actual clinic. Um, the trial was very pragmatic in nature, and the only way the study staff were involved were really performing the gene expert. Everything after that, including uh, the decision to initiate treatment, um, was really done by the routine clinic staff in each of those settings. So, so this was done in um, Cape Town and Durban in South Africa, as well as Urari, Lusaka, and Nebea, which is in southern Tanzania. Um, so, so when this study stood, was designed in 2011, there was really very little known about Gene, Gene Expert besides its um, excellent uh, sensitivity. And uh, we really wanted to know, um, would it be feasible at the point of care? And our logic for wanting to address this question is that there's data from South Africa as well as Malawi um, which shows that even in the gene expert era when you have centralized gene expert testing available, between 10 to 40 percent of patients who actually test positive can fail to uh, return for their results and in fact do not ever start treatment. Um, and I think it's important to emphasize that obviously an expensive real-time PCR machine like gene expert will never substitute a cheap and affordable lateral flow assay. It's nevertheless important to keep in mind that this is still the most um, excellent test that is currently available. And uh, we wanted to explore whether or not if you put it in a well-resourced setting, um, what impact would it have on same-day clinical decision making? And then finally, what would the long-term impact um, of the point of care placement of Gene Expert be? on patient health, and we did that uh, using, uh, using morbidity, uh, using the measurement of morbidity. So, so we randomized 1,500 patients, um, and what we found is that uh, when you compared the sputum that was done at recruitment with an extra sputum that was collected and left for the end of the study, when you compared that initial sputum, which was done by a nurse in the clinic, to that done at the end of the study, which was done by a technician in a centralized laboratory, the sensitivity and specificity were very similar, and also the failure rates were almost identical. Um, so from that perspective, uh, when you put gene experts in these well-resourced clinics, it seems to perform at a very similar level to what you would expect um, from a centralized laboratory with an experienced operator. Um, another key finding was that by virtue of its point of care placement, gene expert uh, almost doubled the number of culture positive patients who were able to initiate treatment on the same day, and also what was quite impressive is that overall, the number of culture positive patients, in other words, the number of true positive TB patients who actually started treatment was, at the end of the study, much higher in the gene expert arm than the smear microscopy arm. So in other words, the implementation of gene expert at the point of care almost halved patient dropout. So these are patients uh, who did not come back and are presumably still contributing to ongoing transmission. Um, 
And then I think, I think the, the final, uh, well, the final uh, key finding of the study was that um, even though Gene Expert had this, uh, this great impact on same-day clinical decision-making, what really took us by surprise is that because of very high rates of empirical anti-TB treatment in the spare microscopy arm, we were actually unable to detect an improvement in patient health with the implementation of Gene Expert. Um, so I think that summarizes the key findings. One question on this empirical treatment um, question. Uh, certainly for malaria, for example, empirical treatment for malaria is very, very common across Africa because for a long, long time there have not been good malaria diagnostics. And the focus now for the use of rapid diagnostic tests for malaria is to try to decrease the massive overtreatment of malaria, uh, decrease drug usage, drug wastage. Do you think that if um, expert or other uh, even simpler diagnostics for TB were available, more widely available point of care that we could curb this excessive use of syndromic management of TB? I, I, yeah, I think that's absolutely essential. So, so in our study, um, we actually had very similar levels of overtreatment in either arm. But that's a very difficult thing to measure because it's a moving target. Obviously, this test was new in the environment. Um, even though we educated clinicians about uh, how you could trust a negative result, um, it was still a novel aspect. Um, so I think I think 30% of culture negative patients in either arm were placed on treatment at empirical grounds. Given the results of your finding, and uh, uh, great, we already have people waiting for questions. But given the results of your finding on um, decreasing the dropouts uh, dramatically. Um, what did you think, what, why do you think that gene expert is still, in fact, mostly not used as a point of care, and what would need to be changed to make it more widely used as a point of care? So I think, I think the primary issue is a cost issue. Um, and uh, countries have, have largely followed the WHO recommendation, which is to place it at a sub district or district level. Um, I think in order to use it in, in TB hotspots, um, the infrastructure needs to be very to improve. Um, in our study, we did not upgrade the infrastructure in any way. Um, so that's key to point out, but we did pre-select very well-resourced clinics and urban settings. Um, so, and, and there are, there are longer-term um, supply chain management issues, um, which were really outside the scope of this study, uh, as well as task shifting issues that I think will need to be explored. Tony. Um, my name is Tony Catanzaro, and I wanted to respond to an obstacle that John brought up in his comments and mentioned my name specifically, having to do with sequencing. So I'm, I'm the head of a project from San Diego that's funded by NIH uh, to do sequencing on drug-resistant uh, isolates to uh, look for new mutations. And, uh, and open access is part of what NIH uh, is very interested in and requires. But they have a particular format of open access which, uh, which excludes communication directly with any companies because they don't want one company to gain an advantage over another company. So the main method for open access communication is publications, which is typically uh, kind of a different uh, forum for uh, reviewing the adequacy of a particular finding for publication. Plus, it's, it's rather slow. Uh, and, uh, and that has been an obstacle because, as I said, uh, when we first put the project together, we had envisioned working directly with HIND. And they put an obstacle in saying, you know, don't do that directly. You can certainly work with them, but uh, only after you've published. So they've gone ahead and done their thing. And there are other companies that would like to work with us with regard to the sequencing. And I just wanted to bring that up for discussion. Do you have any such hindrances on your activities that you're funding? Uh, no, because we haven't got any funding yet to do it. <laughs> um, this, so, it's, I'm not sure if I agree with that funders should put that sort of restriction on what we see as academic information. Um, one of the things that we'd like to do is to set up a, a, a database, and Neil Stoke and my colleague has set up a, what we call a wiki, where people can add data. Uh, and DST information and SNPs, and that's not dependent upon anyone funding it. This is like uh, anyone can put the information in as long as it's good information. So that might get around the IP problems with your funders. How do you 
define a good information when you have an open database? That is one of yes. the problems in compiling data. Good point. Well, I think that's where the publication process comes into play because the review process is pretty stringent. And I think if you've published it in general, th those are good data. You can, you, there can be uh, problems with that as well, but that's what the review process is supposed to ensure. I think if the evidence for a particular new SNP is well presented uh, with good susceptibility testing data, then it's self-evident that it's robust. But some of sensitivity, phenotypic sensitivity data are not as robust, as good as we think. That's the other problem and we are, and this is our comparator still. So what is, I have a question for you. Am I allowed to ask questions as well or not? Okay, thank you. When you were mentioning, uh, Philip, um, the uh, comparison between phenotypic and genotypic. Probably our best comparison is the patient outcome and the response to treatment based on the, the, the change on therapy. Because that is the, the, this is really the kind of data that we are missing. We have a lot of data comparing SNPs and phenotypic. What we do not have are data comparing SNPs and response to therapy. First, we're putting gene expert into administration projects and elsewhere. There was a, a lot of concern about so called false risk resistances, picking up actual mutations that you can confirm by sequencing, but they weren't matched by phenotypic results. And there's the interesting data from Armand Van Duren's group and other groups now showing that some of these mutations, even though they don't cause important changes in MICs, are responsible are responsible for or at least correlated with drug failure just as, as uh, much as the high MIC changes. Uh, so, so I think we have a lot to learn about uh, whether or not you can use, in what cases you can use conventional susceptibility testing to confirm the value of SNPs. And, and it would be nice to have the kind of data of the whole patient outcomes that we so rarely get. There's other questions? No? Can I just add to that? Uh, Sorry, just add to that. I mean, it seems to me that there are two things. One is that what Daniela said, Daniela said is right, but we need to have a discussion. And doing it by papers is quite a slow way. And lots of stuff gets, there's a lot of experience people have that never gets into papers. And the sort of people you have here are the sort of people who have that experience. And the other thing that's really changing is not us, but other people who are going to sequence thousands of TB strains and have. Um, phenotypic data. That's where, it, I think that's going to change the game um, because people are publishing small numbers. Um, if you suddenly get 20,000 strains with good phenotypic data, the question is, are they the same sorts of phenotypic data? But that's going to uh, completely change how I think we, we look at the information that we have. So. So I'm Christina Wallengren from uh, a new organization in South Africa called THINK. And this is, stands for TB and HIV Investigative Network. Uh, and so our organization is available to collaborate on you know, the topics that we're talking about here, diagnostics and collecting samples for gene sequencing and stuff like that. However, my uh, question related back to South Africa and the gene expert where we started. And uh, it's just a comment about how this is implemented. Um, as you know, South Africa is very forward and very successful in the rollout of the gene expert as a, almost a point of care test. Uh, but paradoxically, uh, what is happening is that the gene expert is leading to longer time to diagnose patients and putting them on treatment and to increase workload in the lab. So what is happening, and this is in, again, uh, Durban setting, quite high resource center, where some of the clinical sites actually do have a lab on the site. So what used to happen is that the patients would hang around and wait for their AFB or their, their smear test to be confirmed, uh, and they would get the diagnosis and be put on treatment on the same day. Now that the gene expert has been placed on the same lab, but without additional human resources to be able to you know, take their increased workload, um, the, and the 
the fact that AFB and smears are still the predominant uh, reporting method to one, evaluate the clinical sites. Uh, it means that uh, all of the samples are tested both with a gene expert as well as with a smear. So it, you increase or almost double the, the, the workload in the lab. I know that there are guidelines that are kind of supposed to handle this, but they're not really implemented. So what happens is that the, the patients, uh, they collect two smears uh, or two sputums, one for the gene expert, one for the AFB. Uh, this is not done then in the same day, so the patients have to go back and maybe come back the next day or the next, uh, the next week. And as long uh, as, as uh, these, the AFP uh, is still um, used as one of the predominant, uh, as I said, uh, reporting methods, one, to evaluate uh, the clinic, uh, which is de evaluated by the Department of Health based on the proportion of smear positive patients that are placed on treatment. So that is the reason why you know, all of the samples are also um, tested for AFB. And the second is, of course, with ICD codes, where diagnosing the, the, the disease needs to have the, the AFB smear positivity. And again, I know that the WHO has changed these recommendations so that it should be just positive by any method is OK. Uh, but this information has not trickled down to the sites. And that is why we're seeing a longer time to diagnosis and an increased work in the labs. Over on this side. Uh, quick question, I'm just trying to understand some numbers here. The gentleman from South Africa said that when you have a reference lab uh, testing, you get about 10% to 40% of patients that never get treated, they drop out, we lose them. But our colleague from HIV, which I was very glad to see here today, with lateral flow, point of care testing, says that she still gets 46% dropout of patients. So we're doing all this work to get to a point of care test that will get us the same dropout, potentially the same dropout rate as a reference reference test. So I just want to understand why we think when we bring it to point of care that we're going to do better than they do in HIV. Thanks. Uh, let's come, I'm going to ask Kara to reflect on that very question. Uh, so we'll come back to it as soon as the three people that are standing ask questions, we'll get to that. Um, I'm Aditya with the union. Just one comment, you talked about implementation issues and I just want to emphasize the need of preparing health systems to be able to implement these new tests and have patient flow follow or be prepared to put patients on treatment faster, etc. And I just want to draw your attention to the uh, Prove It symposium that's happening on Saturday afternoon where we're presenting data from three studies that were done in South Africa, Brazil, and Russia looking at the implementation of expert or line probe essays within health systems for drug resistant MDR suspects. Um, the other thing you talked about um, over diagnosis and what expert can do to reduce, uh, sorry, over treatment. And I just want to raise the finger um, and remind you that this is different in children, um, where um, only 20 to 60% of children with TB are expected to be culture positive. So we have a large group of children that have TB that we cannot confirm. Um, an expert does not work very well in children that are culture negative. So we still need something. And, and the more you look at children at the point of care, probably the less likely they are to be um, culture positive just because they might have less severe disease, etc., and haven't been referred to higher levels of care. So, so I think my question to all of you is, and particularly actually, actually Dr. Cirillo, um, the, in the research that you're doing, are you already looking at children or are you planning to do that? There are uh, consensus definitions for <coughs> diagnostics research in children by the NIH um, that could be used that suggest a way to do a clinical diagnosis if you cannot confirm TB with culture. Well, I'll let I think the question is okay. Oh, that's true. For example. <laughs> <laughs> let me just respond real quickly. We get, um, it's a great question, and we get criticized um, at, at fine sometime for not having any pediatric samples in our specimen bank. Um, and that reflects not the fact that we think children are not important, but the fact that it's a difficult group to use to validate um, new assays because you so <coughs> uncommonly know whether or not the children who are not TB really are not TB. So but but I think point. I want to get beyond that point because if you talk to people that work with childhood TB, we think that there are ways to clinically diagnose TB in the absence of culture. And, and I think, you know, to work with you to, to get samples where you have a pretty good clinical certainty of a child having TB or not TB. Uh, Jeff, did you want to respond? So uh, we're very much aware of that issue, and we've been approaching it from multiple perspectives. Uh, the main issue has been 
though the most of those approaches research-wise haven't been funded. Um, so we've been working toward obtaining additional funding for specifically pediatric tuberculosis. Uh, so there's two primary strategies that would use the REF technology, so exactly the same approach that we're already using in sputum that could be done on urine, feces, as well as a uh, non-invasive imaging uh, approach that we've been developing in the lab through bioengineering. Um, we don't know which one is going to work best yet. Uh, but uh, we feel strongly, based on the preliminary data we have up to this point, that there's a very good chance that this type of approach will work uh, rapidly. It's just uh, we need to be able to be uh, pursuing it right now, or not. Larry, you have a question? Yeah, I'm Larry Wong from Brandeis University. Uh, I have a question for really all of the panelists. It's something that uh, Gilla Kaplan brought up yesterday. And that is that many samples are mixed strains of different types of TB. And I wonder to what extent you uh, see that as critical diagnostic upfront information. I don't have the answer, but definitely this is an issue, and we know this is an issue, and this is one of the reasons why uh, the diagnostic trials should be designed in different <coughs> settings, in different uh, geographic areas. So once one, if one test goes into validation, it should be validated in different areas in order to capture all the possible geographic, the, all the possible strains. Uh, the response, I mean, the, the diagnostic capacity, we have already data that some mutations are preferentially associated to some family of strains. So even molecular tests may have a different performance in different areas, that for sure. And this is an issue that is really considered as a, as a priority issue. Regarding the comment of, on the expert that was made before in South Africa, I think one lesson we have learned is that implementing new diagnostic is not only buying the diagnostic, uh, defining the setting, buying the reagents and start working. There is a, a lot of logistic issues that needs to be taken care and very, very carefully in order to achieve the results that we would like to achieve. And then the diagnostic algorithms are also very important. So I can understand that we are overburdening the laboratory if we need to create two parallel systems. Probably two parallel systems should be created only for the first time, I mean at the beginning, and then once we know that the tests are working well, there is a strategic decision that should be taken and all the consequences should be adapted. So we do not have two systems in parallel. I think, Larry, you were talking about individual patients being infected with more than one strain. Is that correct? Yes, or, or so the, the, an, aggressive, so an aggressive strain combined with a less aggressive strain. Yeah. I mean, I think the people who, the, the one place where we're concerned about this is, of course, hetero resistance and trying to detect that. And, and then, of course, people are doing sequencing, so maybe you have a comment on, on this question. Thank you. Um, sequencing, if you do whole genome sequencing, you can pick up uh, down, currently down to about 5%. So if the second strain is there at a level of 5% and the other one is there at 95%, you could pick that up and be able to determine the SNPs associated with that. But lower than 5%, the current technology wouldn't pick it up. But if you monitor throughout treatment, for instance, in the case I was talking about, you could actually, if, if a, a resistant strain that might have been there as a minor strain at the beginning, then becomes the dominant strain during therapy to which it's not sensitive, that could be then picked up subsequently if it's still culture positive, and we can sequence that. Max. Max Solfinger, National Jewish, Denver, Colorado. Mark, you ask about obstacles, and I think one basic obstacle is that conventional antimicrobial susceptibility testing is still not standardized. Everybody does it uh, differently. Second, in terms of uh, <coughs> conventional or phenotypic, when we compare this to high-tech molecular, then I think we are really comparing uh, apple and oranges. And some of the speakers already mentioned the MICs, and I would assume globally 
almost nobody does MICs besides a few research laboratories and so this will be the next step for a uh, quantum leap in, in, in terms of really being able to compare MICs with a mutation or any other uh, biomarkers comp and no longer comparing to conventional AST which is uh, born in the sexes or even before. Kara, um, Danielle made the point that getting um, it implemented as, has, involves a lot more than simply purchasing a machine and some, some, some cartridges. And it occurs to me that, that, that all these logistic challenges uh, are also there if you have a point of care test and in fact maybe the outcome is exposed. Uh, and maybe if you could reflect on your experience with uh, HIV point of care testing where the assays perform very, very well and are quite simple to use. What are the lessons there for us in terms of implementing point of care TB diagnostics, whether with an existing system such as expert or a future system or future letter flow test? I personally think there's um, a bit, quite a difference in lateral flow immunoassays and when you have an analyzer based uh, point of care test, you know? So, talking about lateral flow immunoassay, rapid diagnostic test that can be used at the bedside. Um, uh, I had in my presentation uh, mentioned a few obstacles that we have. In terms of infrastructure, you do not need to, um, to invest a lot, but you need to supervise, I think, the users. I think there should be a focus, and we see um, um, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of issues there. And as I said before, if you have an inpatient department and want to link this person, it's probably easy. Um, but if you have an outpatient, uh, um, it, is, it is much more difficult. And uh, we know from the PIMA, for example, that the initiation takes place much faster than, uh, than it used to be when we had more analyzed based uh, CD4 counts, but uh, it's, it's not reduced to zero. So I'm really impressed when you can say you have a, you have a gene expert and uh, you test the sputum in the morning and initiate in the evening. I think this, these are study data and I think in the routine, this is really not, this is really not possible. I have just been back from an implementation of a study in Cameroon where we used simple lateral flow immunoassays uh, for HIV diagnosis. They are um, performed in the laboratory there, so all clients have to come back the next day to collect the results, and they get counseled, then they get a next follow-up appointment for what it means to be HIV positive, etc. Till their CD4 count is, is done, it takes another day because it's done in the lab again, not with Pima. So the whole process takes nearly up to a month till they finally uh, are, are on treatment when needed. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, Daniel Orozco from FIND. Um, I just want to voice this and I, I want to thank Cara for bringing me back to the MSF times because we, we face these challenges at many levels. It's not only on HIV, it's also on malaria, it's also in any disease that has a point of uh, uh, first contact uh, test. So we have to learn those lessons from those uh, operations that are already ongoing in order to, not, to avoid that in three or five years from now we are going to face the same situation. We spent this week uh, uh, a day, an entire day, trying to convince some people that QC is important, that we need warranty for equipment, that we need to buy panels for quality control. This shouldn't happen anymore. We should be able uh, to, to prepare from now for rolling out uh, operations later on when these tests are, are, are ready. So let's learn the lessons today. Also the links to treatment is, is quite uh, uh, amazing and we will show data, we will see the data all these weeks uh, about how, uh, what is the gap between diagnosis and treatment with the slow pace that we are diagnosing today. When we roll out these new tests, the diagnosis will go up and we need to catch up also on treatment. So uh, what is going to happen? We need to start being ready today for what is gonna happen in three to five years from now. Thanks, Daniel. Oh, this uh, I wanted to come back to this difference in point of care um, and treatment between HIV and TB. I think there's a huge difference in TB. A positive test equals starting treatment and same-day treatment. It's seen as an emergency and all. 
And whereas HIV, there is the counseling, there is the adherence, there is the sessions to make sure that the patient understands its lifelong treatment. And so there is not the tradition to start treatment immediately. So I, I don't think that's, that's a fair argument. And to say that it's, it's study specific and not possible in real life to immediately start people on treatment, I, I don't think that is true, but it, I agree with the previous person who said something about South Africa. Um, what has, in my view, lacked a lot is um, clearly the, the implementation, making it together with uh, capacitating healthcare workers to know exactly what they should do, how they should do it, what the algorithm is, and uh, combining these two trainings, not seeing it as a technical training to how do you do a car, how do you prepare the sample, how do you do the cartridge, and how to interpret or read the result, but then what do you do and how do you put the person on treatment, then it really is possible to the majority of cases to start them um, on the same day, except for those patients who come at two o'clock in the afternoon, their sample is, is only ready by four o'clock and by then the clinic is closing and the healthcare workers do not feel like giving the whole explanation of TB anymore and ask those to come back. Patients who come in the morning except for the few who kind of disappear and leave the clinic and you can't find back, the majority you can really start on the same day if there are clear instructions to the healthcare workers and if they have clinically been trained on what to do. Thank you, it's a, a, a good collection of discussions about implementation. I'd like to spend a few minutes shifting focus and having our panelists who are up here really from more on the R&D side reflect on what they think some of the obstacles are. And Jeff, you've probably been most engaged uh, of the people here and uh, making the transition from an interesting laboratory observation into a piece of clinical kit. And I'd like, can you can you reflect a little bit on what some of the obstacles have been and still are in terms of getting that to be done quickly and effectively? Well, there are so many. <laughs> uh, I, I would say the main issue, at least for us, has been uh, long-term sustained funding. Uh, most of the time, uh, people are looking for something to happen quicker than it can. And the issue, at least for us, is that if we want to put something out there, we have to be sure that it performs better than we need it to, ultimately. And so where we're looking at 90-something percent uh, sensitivity and 80 percent specificity, we'd like to be closer to 100 percent because when it gets to the field, um, it may not get used appropriately. So that also is another barrier, is, is making sure that uh, the protocols are extremely sim simple, that they're geared for the environment that they're actually going to be used in. Uh, for example, we talk about a, a simple reader that's very low cost, but even that may be, uh, to some degree, a barrier. Uh, we're looking at a battery-operated system that doesn't involve a core, doesn't have a power cord. Um, that would be great, uh, uh, but can it be recharged if it needs to be? And will batteries be available? Uh, could ultimately be a problem. And then looking at the implementation of the plasticware. I mean, we're talking about a very simple cup, but even that has some issues. Is it breakable? Um, will the reagents be kept at a temperature that we have already looked at? So when you look at uh, storage environments, we think mostly room temperature is great and the test is designed for room temperature, but uh, clearly room temperature varies a great deal across the environments for tuberculosis diagnostics, and so we've had to consider up temperatures up to 45 degrees, which was mentioned by somebody else, I think it was Kara actually, that mentioned the, uh, the issue with 45 degree storage environment. So how long can it be stored at that temperature and still maintain the sensitivity and specificity? And so. Uh, it, it, I could go on and on, but uh, uh, the issues are complex, and, and to really address all of the issues, we need to do standardization in the lab, and uh, that takes personnel, and very, very good personnel that are not just scientists, but also driven by the problem, that understand that this is something that is a time-dependent issue, people are dying every day, and we need to try to do something about that. I was uh, seeing on the news, uh yesterday that um, for the first time in a long time, uh, funding for uh, TB research is going down. Um, uh, certainly, uh, you must be able to reflect a little bit on the availability of funds to make some of these transitions and 
specifically which phases are the most dif difficult to get funding for? Well, so um, the science, the interesting science, I'd say, is a little bit, even though it's difficult, particularly in the US right now, um, they're funding out around 5%. Uh, so that's pretty bad. But uh, uh, the interesting science can still get funded. But to get something funded at this stage of that transition before, it's definitely a product. Um, and it's a developed, interesting product. That, that gap, I, I, I've heard people call it the cliff, um, basically that you jump off of and most startup companies die at that stage. Uh, it's because, yes, it looks very promising, but you don't have anything that are gonna give investors back money within the next year. Uh, and that's what people, as well as governments, as well as even some of the funding agencies are looking at. So filling that gap has been the most difficult. Uh, and we did obtain Welcome Trust funding for that, but then when you get um, outside your milestones because of reality, um, they, they don't extend the funding at, at, at more. So now we have funding gaps on, on development as well. So those two gaps when things don't play to a sp very specific timeline and that are before you actually have a, say, nine month or six month window to a product, those are the most difficult. David, your question? Yeah, uh, David Moore, London School of Medicine, Medicine. I have a, a comment and a couple of questions. The first comment is, um, thank you, uh, a good session with lots of great science in it, and it did occur to me that were I one of the members of the New Diagnostics Working Group and wasn't able to come to this session, I, I'd be blind to a lot of this. I haven't, a lot of this was new to me, uh, particularly um, uh, Robert's work, which is fantastic and an enormous amount of work, and a lot of it's publicly available. And it occurred to me that one of the roles of the New Diagnostics Working Group needs to be to be disseminating this uh, this sort of uh, information. Um, and with ten thousand uh, dollars, that's insulting, isn't it? Doesn't that suggest that uh, partnership doesn't value the working group? I mean, I don't, I don't see how you can do anything useful with ten thousand dollars. That's a comment, really, because I know you agree with me, Daniel. Um, I have uh, two questions. So uh, the first was to um, uh, Dr. Cerillo. Uh, very exciting technology. Uh, it obviously relies on live organisms, and I wondered if you worked on it, I'm sure you have actually, to, to look at the response to treatment and whether or not you can use it as an indicator of response or an early indicator of response to treatment. Um, and then the other question was really about point of care testing. And this is a question to everybody on the panel, really. Um, point of care testing does seem to be a, a goal we should aspire to reach. But do we want point of care drug susceptibility testing? Is that something that? Uh, is going to be useful, or is that something that's going to put information in the hands of people we don't want to be handing our, our second line drug regimens? Jeff, why don't you respond to this one? So, in terms of drug susceptibility testing, um, that was one of the goals when we started out: is to be able to design a test that would allow us to look at viability of the organisms and drop in viability. And so, what we see is we see a drop in signal within the first few hours after the test, so it looks like we could do a drug, drug susceptibility test within two to four hours after acquisition of the sample. Um, so we're quite excited about that, and, and then your other question about should there be a point of care, um, I guess ultimately to me is if we could do it um, and we could impact the treatment of those patients uh, in a positive fashion, I think we should be doing it. Um, I think we have to trust those clinicians that are on the ground. I understand that there can be problems with having the drugs at that level, but I also understand that we've got a lot of clinicians out there and, and uh, non-clinicians, even staff, that understand the issues well and uh, can manage it appropriately. But that's that's our perspective at this point, is to try to get something that could be used there. David, it's, it's a very interesting question. I think there's been a lot of thinking about this recently, and clearly uh, it was an important question for us when when the gene expert process started, uh, and we wondered whether or not RIF should be in it or not, uh, and secondarily, whether we should have a function that could disallow the reporting of RIF resistance in some levels of the health system. In the end, it was a, a, it, it was a very useful thing to include. I'm glad, I'm glad we did, and it has had, I think, some stimulating effect on trying to get have countries that are not currently treating MDR patients to start thinking about doing so. It gets more complicated, but but as you as you rightly point out um, in your subtext, uh, RIF resistance testing is really a 
highlighter or marker for IMDR risk. It's not a specific assay to tell you which of the, of the 12 drugs available would you choose from if you were selected. So should MDR be managed at point of care uh, and should MDR drug selection? And I think the, the current thinking about this, and I invite any other panelists to, to, to comment, is if there is more than one regimen available, there's a PAMZ regimen, a REMOX regimen, a, a standard regimen available, and the, and the lower level treatment mon treatment uh, center would be selecting regimen A or selecting regimen B, and if that could be informed by rapid molecular testing, I can see that that might make sense. Uh, however, doing sophisticated one by one uh, testing for second line drug resistance in the clinic does seem a stretch and, and perhaps not a, perhaps not a pretty good idea. Sorry, just to come back, so that wasn't by any means a, a subtext to attack expert. It was really <coughs> when you're developing diagnostics. Are we, should we be asking diagnostic developers to not worry too much about drug susceptibility testing for point of care tests because the reality is that won't lead to action at the point of care or, as you say, if we get PAMZ or a second regimen that can be instantly um, implemented in, this, in the context of drug resistance, maybe that does make more sense. So I guess it depends on linking it with the, with the drugs available. No, no, absolutely. But I mean the point is the alignment between diagnostic and treatment. That's <laughs> well, this I just wanted to add, and this is some of the earlier discussion going to point, Dave, is that what we hear from a lot of researchers that people are not aware of, there's really, uh, I'm not aware and others would know, is there really a global inventory? There's lots of investments in diagnostics, but people don't know who's doing similar research. And that's not sharing data, that's not sharing proprietary information, or rather at least having some inventory of who's doing similar research. Is that publicly available? and people don't have to go to meetings to find out who is doing something there where there may be the opportunity for collaboration and information sharing. We're going to have to wrap this up. I'm going to ask uh, Robert to reflect on what he thinks obstacles are from the discovery side uh, for getting to point of care, and then we'll have some closing comments. So, uh, thanks, Mark. And I, I think um, you know, coming from the, the technology point of view, there, there is a lot of um, exquisite techniques, exquisite technologies that were out there that we can use to get to the point of really 100% um, specificity, sensitivity is, a, is another aspect. Um, but, you know, working in a laboratory setting, other, you know, uh, high technology research components, we can get, uh, you know, new ways and new methods to start to work quite well. But as um, was previously mentioned, you get to this cliff point of how do you actually take those technologies into the field, and, and just listening to the earlier comments about how uh, Gene Expert was rolled out into, into different um, um, realms, uh, I think we can easily set up now uh, with the, the technology, the, the sensitivity and, and detection capabilities of, of uh, genome sequencing, also with proteomics, we're actually um, making large inroads into. Um, not only measuring, but also positing both the data as well as uh, the technology and the open resource um, components. We've been at the Institute of Systems Biology, we've been very um, um, forthright about not only releasing uh, information database, but also releasing our primary data so that it can all be used. And I think that should be a primary um, component. But I just want to um, ask one, one last question that, that um, starts to phrase how we should. Um, think about translational things, what was the, the impediments or, or, or the criteria that you had to use to roll out gene expert into fields where they were only being uh, looked at smear tests and things like that? What, what was the, the failure rate or the conditions you had to, to train the technicians to actually use that? Um, so so, so we, we selected uh, clinics that already, sorry, we, we selected clinics that already had um, a supposedly stable uh, uh, infrastructure such as um, electricity supply. Um, but having said that, almost half of our test failures were actually caused by power disruptions, which the gene expert UPS was unable to cope with. So we, it's now 12.30, uh, we'll need to close. Uh, there are other meetings that will be waiting right here. I want to thank everyone for being involved, especially our, our panelists, and also for the very responsive audience that helped us get through some very interesting questions. Thank you.